I'm Josh Klein. And I'm Elise Hugh. We host a podcast from Accenture called Built for Change. Every part of every business is being reinvented right now. That means companies are facing brand new pressures to use fast evolving technologies and address shifting consumer expectations. But with big changes come even bigger opportunities. We've talked with leaders from every corner of the business world to learn how they're harnessing change to totally reinvent their companies. And how you can do it too. Subscribe to Built for Change now so you don't miss an episode. Welcome to GapFest Reads. I'm David Plotz, one of the hosts of Slate's Political GapFest. Exit Interview, The Life and Death of My Ambitious Career, would be a brilliant book if it were about any workplace in America. Christy Coulter writes hilariously and cuttingly about meetings, performance reviews, more meetings, the big boss, corporate memos, also meetings. And it is as vivid a portrait of modern American white collar work as The Office or Severance. But Exit Interview is not about any workplace. It's about Amazon, the biggest and most important company in the world. So this very funny memoir is also the most gripping insider account of life in the company ever written. It is filled with so much dirt and so much insight. I spent a bunch of my time while I was reading Exit Interview wondering how it is that Christie has not been sued or how it is that she has not been disappeared into a prime truck by some Jeff Bezos minion. So Christy, glad you're here. You're in an undisclosed location, perhaps hiding from <laughs> Bezos minions. Uh, congratulations on your your great, great memoir, which is also a great, great business book. Thank you so much. I'm ha- excited to be here. Just to give people a sense of the the voice here, I can I ask you to read your wonderful chapter, Assimilation Notes? And one great thing about this book, readers, very short chapters. So yes, this chapter is called Assimilation Notes, and it is set uh, maybe a couple of months after I started working at Amazon. There are so many men here, men from Sloan and the University of Michigan and McKinsey and Deloitte. They're transitioning to barefoot running. They bought Vibrams last month and a sous vide machine. They like big, hairy, audacious goals, and in college, they once saw Modest Mouse five times in a year. They have three kids and a wife with an expired law license because it just made more sense for her to be the stay-at-home parent. They work standing up. They've slowly come around on Belgian ales and heard something on Tim Ferriss' podcast that really made them think. They wish they had more time to read. If they take you to Delmonico's, they expect you to eat a steak. When they interrupt you at your desk, they're sorry for the drive-by. When something goes wrong, they're working on a path to green. They don't just agree, they violently agree. They're blocking and tackling and focused on the inputs and not getting distracted by orthogonal matters. Going paleo has been huge for them, and tequila is allowed. Can they just play devil's advocate for a second? Can they just pressure test your idea? Can they just push back on that a little? These last three are them saying, you are wrong. Sometimes they say it in an Amazon way, and sometimes in a man way, though already the difference is getting pretty hard to discern. (laughs) It's so good. It's so good. <laughs> I loved writing that. That that chapter is when it started, the book started to kind of crack open for me, um, just getting all that down on paper. <laughs> so briefly, what did you do for Amazon? For how long did you do it? What Amazon projects that we know about did you have a hand in? Yeah. So I spent 12 years at Amazon. Um, I had a hand in just the, you know the regular retail business, also Amazon Publishing, Frustration Free Packaging, Amazon Go. Uh, those are probably the big ones. Uh, the Peculiar Ways quiz that I think is now out there publicly. I was a co-writer of that. Um, I had my hands in just many, many different parts of the company. This is a really critical book, but it is also true that Amazon is a phenomenally successful company. So what are the two most valuable things you learned from working at this company? Positive things, things that if you were going to an ex-corporate job, you would bring. So one is I got very comfortable with being in ambiguous or chaotic situations and and not only 
being fine, but thriving that way. Um, you know, if you can't deal with ambiguity, you will not last five minutes at Amazon because things change so much and you're constantly thrown into new situations. And um, I discovered that I love that and uh, and I kind of miss it. You know, my life is, is a little more predictable now. Um, the other one is I have many more transferable skills than I would have realized. Um, I went from working in retail merchandising at Amazon, something I basically understood to, I ran a a literary translation imprint. I was the principal writer for Just Walk Out Shopping, something I'd never heard of. I taught uh, management theory to vice presidents and directors. I never would have expected I could do these things. And what I realized is that if you have critical thinking skills, you can listen, you can learn, and you know how to ask good questions, you can take yourself a lot further than you thought. I can't perform dentistry. (laughs) Obviously, there are limits to this. But I feel like you know, subject matter can be learned, and I could go in a lot of new directions that I've never considered, just based on what I've already got. What's the flip side of that question? What are two of the most poisonous things that you got out of working from Amazon or two of the most poisonous things in Amazon's culture? I think, um, you know, to this day, there's a little voice in my head that is the Amazon voice saying, you know, you're really nothing special. You're lucky to have a job at all. What have you done for me lately? I was kind of wired to think that way already. And I think Amazon took it and ran with it. They didn't implant that in my brain, but they they really amplified it. And um, just the sheer fatigue. <laughs> I, I'm still kind of tired. It's been five years since I left the company. And just the sheer sense that there's nothing you can do that is ever quite enough, that there's 15 things you forgot to do that day, and you don't know which ones are going to come back to bite you. Um, that is something I still kind of drag around. Um, if uh, The third, of course, would be, I think, the, the gender aspect of working at Amazon, which was that, um, you know, at my level, of something like 20, 25% female. And so you always feel a little bit like a guest worker. Um, I never really felt like I, I fit in. And once you've seen that, you you really can't unsee it. It changes how you how you operate in the world. Can you talk a little bit about some of the particular ways that that sexism manifested itself? Yeah, it's so it's not like the Silicon Valley stories that you know I read about in Vanity Fair and things like that. There are no hot tub orgies, or I, I certainly wasn't invited to any at least. Um, it's not a place be, of you'd overt. have to spend they'd have to spend money on a exactly, hot tub. They would exactly. not want to spend money on the hot tub. No, no hot tubs. Hot tubs are for your own time. Um yeah, Amazon does not like to spend money on employees. It's more insidious than that. It's a culture based on, you know, this idea of meritocracy, which has been picked apart a lot in the last few years, um, especially by um, thinkers of color. And, you know, the problem with meritocracy is at Amazon, it was treated as though it were a, the, a natural system, you know, that just exists without being created by humans. And so the idea was, well, if women were qualified for these jobs or wanted these jobs, they would just rise into them. They would just take them. And so everyone's kind of allowed to fool themselves into thinking this is how things are supposed to be. And most of the men that I worked with at Amazon were certainly not overtly sexist. And I have a feeling that they pride themselves on not being sexist internally either. And they are able to keep thinking that way because this idea of meritocracy keeps spinning and spinning and making everyone think that this is the way that the world is meant to be. It's very hard to to kind of interrupt that. You know, it's, you can get in front of someone who's being a sexist jerk and say, hey, here's the five things you did that are really offensive. But it's very tough to convince someone with really good intentions that he's not thinking of women as full people. I don't know how to do it. I did think one of the things you do so well in the book is is depict this world without boundaries, that you have a work life that has no end. There's this passage you where some some executive comes in and tells everyone, it's okay for you to to leave at 5.30 on a Friday once or twice a year. And I, as I read that, I was like, you know, if I've worked till 5.30 on a Friday in the last year, I cannot remember doing it. Um, and 
most people I think are done, you know, if they're done at four o'clock is cocktail hour in most oh, yeah. I know about, but that does not seem to be the truth at Amazon. No, it is. Uh, Jeff Bezos has talked publicly, I think about, he doesn't believe in work-life balance. He believes in work-life harmony. And I'm not totally sure what that means, but it, it essentially means you're never, you're never not at work. What was very common for people I knew is they would, you know, go home at 5.30 or 6, deal with their families. I don't have children, so my life was a little bit easier in that way. But they would deal with their kids, have dinner with the family, put the kids to bed, and then they would be back online by 9 o'clock and you know, answering emails at midnight sometimes. So you would have this whole second workday after your workday. Um, there really is or was no end to it. And to some degree, I don't mind, like, I don't need to turn off my work brain at five o'clock and not think about work till the next day. But it was the fact that there were expectations that you were still responding and actively thinking about work problems that was, that really gets under your skin and and starts to, you know, pervade your life in ways that, uh, again, are insidious. Given all that you've just said, why is it that so many people want jobs, the white collar jobs at Amazon. And I'm sure they have tons of applicants for every position and people are desperate to be there. I think people understand that Amazon is an incredible place to learn. Amazon will make you smarter when you leave than when you you came in. Um, It also looks great on a resume. I mean, if you can survive Amazon, it kind of says, you know, you're tough, you're, you can think on your feet. Um, You're probably pretty agile. So that's what I think, you know, I was on um, the pivot podcast a couple weeks ago, and Scott Galloway said, you know, my students seem to love Amazon, they go there. And I I thought, well, you know, yeah, if you go and you go in with a plan, and you're going to stay for maybe two years max, then, and you land in the right place, I think you could probably have a decent experience. Um, Then there's also, you know, the stock was going crazy for a while. Like we can't underestimate money as a reason people want to be there. Um, Although I think you could probably do just as well at some of the less brutal tech companies. But yeah, I think people who want to work on big things and projects that sound kind of crazy from the outside, Amazon is the place to be, or at least it, it certainly was during my time. I don't, I don't know if that's changing. I'm Josh Klein. And I'm Elise Hugh. We host a podcast from Accenture called Built for Change. Every part of every business is being reinvented right now. That means companies are facing brand new pressures to use fast evolving technologies and address shifting consumer expectations. But with big changes come even bigger opportunities. We've talked with leaders from every corner of the business world to learn how they're harnessing change to totally reinvent their companies. And how you can do it too. Subscribe to Built for Change now so you don't miss an episode. I want to do a little bit of jumping around to various things that you wrote about that interested me. So uh, one, you talk about your first job at Amazon where you working on merchandising, you're helping to sell products by promoting them. And one of the things that happened while you were there is that you came to realize or the company came to realize that algorithms did a lot better than humans in suggesting the right products for customers to buy next and hyping them. And that the creative skills that you and so many of the people who worked for you had like the gift of a well-turned phrase or discerning judgment didn't actually matter very much. I wonder how that made you feel. It was really tough on the people who worked for me because most of them had been hired, you know, years before I was hired specifically because they knew music and they knew movies and they could write and they could review products. Um, but the thing about those algorithms is they're, they just are better. I mean, they're more precise. You know, if we showed an engineering textbook to the Amazon audience in general, nobody's going to buy it. But if we were able to target it to people who had looked at other engineering books, then we could really maximize that space. So from a business perspective, it made a lot of sense. Um, I felt I was in a 
double bind because on the one hand, as someone who came from the editorial world, I had a lot of sympathy for how left behind these people felt. And um, I see a place for a site to have a voice. I think you can do both. Frankly, you can give customers their AI generated recs, and you could also tell them what tastemakers are are looking at and listening to. But I also had just landed in this place and I had a pretty clear set of instructions. So, you know, I wanted to keep my job. And so it was also frustrating for me that there was so much resistance from the merchandisers because I was thinking, hey, I moved here <laughs> from Michigan to help this transition continue and I'm going to get it done come hell or high water. And uh, you people don't seem to be on board with that. So my heart was with them and my panicky secret heart, (laughs) which wanted to stay employed was, um, and which also has a, you know, my pragmatic side too, was very much on the, we've got to keep moving away from this or I'm out of here. Amazon is a little bit like one of those Viking ship rides at carnivals, you know, that swings way back and forth. And I've since seen it go back to having much more of an editorial point of view. And I think that's great and healthy for the site. Um, I don't know business-wise, I have no no insight into whether it's achieving their goals, but there are those ineffable things you can't measure that are important for a brand. What is a bar raiser? And is it a brilliant or appalling idea of Amazon's? <laughs> So a bar raiser, great question. A bar raiser is someone who is kind of a super interviewer. You're specially trained to interview job candidates from more or less across the company. I was a bar raiser and I could interview anyone at my level or below who wasn't in a technical role. You know, I can't evaluate code. And the idea of a bar raiser is that you are looking for long-term fit, um, that tricky phrase culture fit is essentially what you're evaluating for. And you're not on the team that's hiring, which is often kind of a team that's panicked about getting someone in to fill an empty seat. You know, they might be inclined to lower their standards to go for any warm body. So I interviewed like at least 800 people um, in my time in Amazon, many of those as a bar raiser. And um, that was my job was to go in, think, will these people make it at Amazon beyond this specific role, and then guide the hiring team toward making the right decision. It's it's a great idea in some ways. I do think the idea of interviewing for culture fit went kind of uninterrogated for too long. And it just became, you know, are we reproducing what we already have here? Because that's the culture, you know, tough people, men, people with who are heavier on quantitative skills than qualitative. Um, you know, you get into this sort of uh, snake eating its tail situation. Although in my last couple of years of the company, I did see Amazon start to question that, start to say like, hey, when we say culture fit, you know, what are we actually talking about? And have some good conversations. Everyone who reads about Amazon always wants to read about Jeff Bezos or Jeff Bezos's yacht or Jeff Bezos's girlfriend. <laughs> you had some direct experience with Jeff Bezos. And I, there's a wonderful scene where you get into a debate with him where you debate the question of whether it is right to say that Amazon knows that customers will love something or hopes that they will love something. Can you describe that? Yeah, we were um, running, I believe we were running a sweepstakes or something for wish list. It was something where we were giving customers a chance to win things. And I used to write the Jeff letters, the dear customer letters um, on the, the website, or my team members would. And I had said, you know, we know you'll love these prizes or something like that. And Jeff said, we should say, we hope you love these prizes. And I was like, okay, I mean, I wasn't going to fight this point, but I said, you know, but why? And he said, well, we never want to, it would be arrogant to presume we know what customers will like, which I thought was a really good point. And this was early, within a couple years, probably early in my Amazon career, and it stuck with me forever. I, um, a decade later in the book, I'm talking about something I was writing for Amazon Go, and that point came back to me. And, you know, I was the only one in the room who remembered it, who said, no, 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 we shouldn't say this. We shouldn't be arrogant. You know, it's hard for me to see Jeff Bezos as anything but just this guy in a room, despite the kind of weirdly jacked and yacht-owning 
glamorazzi figure he's become now because that's who I knew. And he really was concerned about these specific little things like that, um, that he thought could play a role in making or breaking Amazon. Are you respecting customers and their individuality or are you telling them that you know better? He was he was a real stickler. I And I, I admire that greatly. One of the running themes of exit interview is you not getting promoted and no, no offense. <laughs> yes. I mean, it, you, you write about it. It's not, it's not my fault. <laughs> no, no, no. Promoted. <laughs> oh yeah. And yeah. At some point the, the, the description for what it would take to get promoted from the level you're at level seven, I think to go to level eight or maybe you're at level six going to level yeah. seven is you needed to have nearly superhuman talent and stamina <laughs> discuss. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I so level seven to level eight, which is what I was going for, it's it's a notoriously tough promotion to get at Amazon. Um, I was perpetually, you know, a year away. Like I had this dangled in front of me so many times. Um at one point I was told I just needed to change the world to get promoted to level eight. And yeah, the last time we I had the conversation, the official leveling document for for level eight said that these people need nearly superhuman stamina and grit or something like that. I know stamina was part of it. And I just looked at my boss and I was like, you know, I don't think I should have to be nearly superhuman to to get a promotion at this company. I'm not even trying to become the CEO. I'm just trying to, you know, jump, like take one step up the ladder. And and he agreed. He said, no, I think this is is crazy. Um, but it was just, it was really one of those moments where I thought, you know, I'm kind of screwed here. Like this is not going to happen for me. And I was late enough in my Amazon career that uh, critically, I also was no longer willing to try to be superhuman. I really just thought I should be able to be a human who is very, very good at her job and get that promotion. And so I worry, you know, when you mentioned earlier that there's tons of people who are dying to work for Amazon, I'm sure that's still true. But I know that in Seattle, there's lots of people who won't even take the phone call. Um, You know, they don't want to talk to the recruiter. They have basically ruled out Amazon. And I think it's because of stories like this that have spread and everyone's got, you know, a neighbor or a friend or an ex or whoever who has had a really grueling experience. And um, I don't think the company's you know, it is possible to run out of people at some point. And I think that kind of attitude about expecting people to be superhuman is is moving Amazon in that direction. Yeah, that's a really good point. How many levels above eight are there? I mean, if you have to be superhuman to get from seven to eight, <laughs> yeah. and no, I mean, se- seven to eight does not sound that high up. It seems like they're probably some, you know, you could probably get to 10, I bet. Yeah, there's it's it's almost like how hotels don't have a floor 13. There's like 12 levels, but one of them is missing. Like there's no level 11 or something like that. And I don't even know why, but yeah, there's so I was a basically at the the upper range of middle management. There's director above me that was level 8, VP, senior VP and Jeff. So essentially there was I was, you know, probably I guess like two thirds of the way up more or less. So yeah, it makes you wonder like how in the world do you get to VP if to be director, you need to be superhuman. Like you have to actually be able to like control the weather with your mind to be a vice president or something. That's my presumption. In any company, these promotions are harder to get as you move up the ranks. It's not that hard at Amazon to get promoted from entry level to the next step up. But um, the promotion system is pretty chaotic. Like the reasons that I was always a year away, but not quite there at some point just seemed to feel like people were just making them up because I'm not sure anybody really knew. And, um, and it did become a big theme of the book because it was a big source of shame for me. I kept thinking like something is wrong with me. Something is wrong with me. And um, eventually I thought, well, you know, maybe there's reasons, good reasons you've not been promoted, but the company is also not told a good story about it. So it's not all you, you know, and I, I really wanted to call it out. A lot of this book is also about sort of shining a light on the shame that people who work for Amazon often feel. And so I thought, well, what better way to do that than making myself an example of someone who felt ashamed because she couldn't move up the ladder? 
Um, I mean, I was very much, I call myself like a Hillary Clinton, you know, from like the age of five, I was the girl who wanted the extra credit, who, you know, would freak out if she got a B plus instead of an A minus. Um, so I was used to getting promoted. That was like sort of my, my profession was getting promoted. And I suddenly was in a place where I could not do it to save my life, even though my jobs got bigger and bigger. I assume you signed NDAs or you had some employment agreement. How have you gotten away with writing this book? And have they threatened you with any legal action? They have not. I I assume I signed something. You know, I have a friend who was telling me recently, she started at Amazon probably in like around 2000. And a couple of years ago, they contacted her and they said, you know, we've, we've lost your NDA. Would you mind signing another one? And she was like, well, I'll sign an exact copy of the one I signed back then. Um, so Amazon's record keeping can be a little chaotic. I set out, I mean, it's a literary book, you know, it's not a policy book. It's not a book about the secret sauce behind Amazon. So I basically just set out to tell my story from my point of view. I very deliberately didn't do any research, you know, now and then I needed to check if, did we have a kitchen store in 2008? And I would use Amazon's own press releases. So I really tried to just stay away from anything that would give me inside information. I didn't have any documentation from when I left the company. I probably had a couple old performance reviews and that's it. And of course, I knew the book would have an extensive legal review with my publisher, which it did. But still, yes, I was nervous. Um, but it's been it's been very quiet. I mean, Amazon is not really that litigious a company. Uh, you'll see a couple lawsuits a year where they've sued someone for breaking a non-compete agreement. It's usually somebody very high up, you know, who's basically walked away with intellectual property. But yeah, I think they're just basically sort of ignoring me. And uh, that's fine with me. Do you still shop at Amazon? I've never been someone who bought everything on Amazon. There were people who worked at Amazon who were very proud of not shopping anywhere else. And I always found that just, I don't know. It's just, I'm not a joiner in some ways. Like that was drinking a little too much Kool-Aid. I've always bought most of my books at regular bookstores because I live in a city that has them and I like going to them. But if you need like a very specific kind of spatula and you need it overnight, like, yeah, I don't know a better place to go than Amazon. So I do. I buy my protein shakes through Amazon. We have to subscribe and save for a couple things. Um, I do find it to be a harder and harder store to shop just from a customer experience perspective. I feel like in the last few years, the product pages have gotten really crowded and some of the delivery promises are, are off. Like I feel like it's degrading, which actually does make me sad. Um, and I don't, I don't know what, why that is. During the pandemic, there seemed to be a lot, a flood of products. There were a lot of complaints about products coming in that weren't as advertised. And it seems to be like third party sellers. I don't know if they're domestic or if this is something coming from overseas, but it seemed like fraud got to be a much bigger problem on the platform. Um, if I know anything about Amazon, I know that they, they care very, very much about that. Um, customer experience was not something people at Amazon just paid lip service to. They were obsessed with it. But I also, it feels like it's gotten ahead of them, you know, the, the flood of, of products that are iffy and um, they're having trouble getting, you know, just getting out in front of that. So I don't, I don't really see how they, how they fix that. This is not really a question, but in closing, I would just note listeners that the voice in exit interview, the, the 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 book this book reminded me most of, oddly, is Julie and Julia, the Julie Powell memoir of of uh, writing her way or cooking her way through Julia Child's uh, cookbook, and it it has nothing in common thematically, really, at all. But there's something uh, similarly vivid and wonderful and extremely human in the voice of of you, Christy Coulter, and um, Congratulations. So good job. Thank you. It's a great compliment. I am a memoirist. You know, I'm a literary writer and I wanted to sort of put a human face on this company that I think people see as just a large entity. So, um, and I wanted it to be fun to read. So um, I'm happy if I did my job. Mm -hmm. 
Christy Coulter's book is Exit Interview, The Life and Death of My Ambitious Career. It's wonderful. That is it for this month's edition of GabFest Reads. Our producer is Shana Roth. Ben Richmond is Senior Director of Operations of Podcasts. Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio at Slate. We will be back next month with another edition of GabFest Reads. Until then, John and Emily and I will be back in your feed on Thursday with a new episode of the Slate Political GabFest.